You know, when we look out in the religious world, and I, I get a lot of uh, newsletters from all kinds of religious groups, some churches, some religions, some faiths are so focused on numbers, they will do almost anything to boost their attendance. And you can see this on uh, TV and listen to it on the radio or online, and you'll see all kinds of gimmicks that congregations will use. Now, if we love the Lord, we certainly desire growth. I, I pray for growth every single day. I imagine you do too. But not at any cost. We need to recognize there are things more important than numbers when it comes to the church of our Lord. And that's what we want to look at this week. I was kind of reminded of that when I was reading some of these articles and, and newsletters. What are some of the things that are more important than numbers? Paul mentions the first one in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, when he tells those churches this in verse 10 of Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> Paul writes, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So the first thing here that's more important than numbers is the favor of God. I don't think there's any doubt that the more we try to please men, the larger the crowd would be. We could do all kinds of things that would fill the pews. We could offer people money. We could offer people money. And that would please men. Wouldn't please God though. And that's why Paul said, what am I here for? Am I concerned about pleasing men or am I more concerned about pleasing God? Back especially in the, in the 80s and 90s and, and even into the 2000s, uh, many churches in uh, metropolitan areas before they began would actually send out surveys to the community they wanted to, to plant a church in and ask the people what they wanted in a new church. And that's what they would start the church with. It's whatever the people wanted. And it didn't make any difference if the people wanted it. That's what they would put into the church. And a lot of, of very unbiblical, unscriptural practices and processes were started that very way. Give the people what they want. The Bible makes it very clear. It's better to seek God's favor than that of people. Because on judgment day, we're only going to answer to God. There are not going to be any people there at all that I have to answer to. In Hebrews chapter 4, you know we've been studying that great book. In verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 4, the writer makes this statement, And there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. Notice that last part. Who do we give account to? To God. Not to people. He's the one who's going to determine my eternal destiny. Remember that great judgment scene? Matthew chapter 25. You know, he, he ends up Matthew 24 by talking about there's not going to be any signs when I come back. Well, he begins Matthew 25 by talking about giving some parables about being ready. And about halfway through the chapter, he says what? I'm going to come back, Jesus says. The judge is going to come back and sit on his throne. And he's going to divide everybody into two groups. The sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And what's he going to do? He's going to pronounce judgment. That's how that section ends. He's going to say to those goats that's on his left, depart into everlasting punishment. There's going to be weeping and wailing of teeth. So, the God's favor is what we want to be concerned about, not people's favor. 
The second thing that's more important than numbers that many, many religious groups have gotten far away from is sound preaching. One of the last things the Apostle Paul wrote was about this very thing. 2 Timothy chapter 4. As far as we know, this is the last uh, thing that Paul wrote that we have recorded. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come, not might, will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will hang up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Many people, sadly, especially in our country, desire only the kind of preaching that tickles the ears. I call it cotton candy preaching. A lot of fluff, but not a lot of substance. What does our text say? Our text says what sound preaching is about. What healthy, whole preaching is about. It's about preaching about the second coming. When Jesus comes back, verse 1, it says that preachers are to be a herald of the oracles of God. Remember, that's what preachers are to preach. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, the oracles of God. What God has said. I don't remember exactly what, what preacher said this, but preachers are not to be the chef. We don't make the food. We don't prepare the food. What do we do? We deliver the food. That's our only job. We're not supposed to change the food in any way. We just deliver it. Well, that's what a herald is. A preacher is a herald, a proclaimer of what God's Word says. Not someone that has authority to change it, but someone that delivers it. He's the mouthpiece of God. This includes preaching when it's popular and when it's not. He says, be ready in season and out of season. Sometimes it's more popular, sometimes it's not popular. Preachers are not supposed to be concerned about whether it's popular or not. It means to do what? Condense, rebuke, exhort. Those three words basically hit all the parts of us. Convince has to do with intellectually. Reprove has to do with morally. And the last one, rebuke or exhort, emotionally. So preaching needs to, to uh, apply to all those parts of us. It means to do what? It means to preach on controversial topics, unpopular topics. I wouldn't be surprised if one day it becomes illegal to preach about, uh, you know, the LGBTQT community and transgenderism. It may become illegal to preach about that. Well... If we're sound preachers, that won't stop us if it's illegal. We'll go ahead and preach about it regardless. Back in the Old Testament, something kind of happened along the same line during the time of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 5, the prophet says this in verse 31. Jeremiah 5 and verse 31. It says, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? The people will love to have it so. And sound preaching means preaching with perseverance. He says, you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of evangelists, fulfill your ministry. So something more important than numbers is sound preaching. 
Something that goes right along with that is warning against sin and error. Jesus, of course, understood the importance of this. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus says this, beginning in verse 7. He's addressing the scribes and Pharisees. This is what he says to them. Hypocrites. That may not be the best way to start a sermon, but that's why he did it. Hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me and in vain, useless, empty. They worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of his mouth. This defiles a man. Notice what his disciples said. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? This is Jesus' response in verse 13. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They're blind. Leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. You know, generally if people are offended... They will leave. In other words, they would rather be told that they're okay in their religious errors or their sinful practices than being made uncomfortable. So they're just going to leave. And of course you see that in the religious world with a lot of mega churches. That's exactly what happens. Nothing offensive is ever taught or preached because people would leave. The best course of action is always to warn people. How awful it would be if you go by a house that's burning down and you know people are in it and will die unless you say something to them. You know, people are dying and being lost every single day. It's always the best course of action to warn them. And hopefully, prayerfully, at least a few will repent if they come to understand they need to. When Paul wrote that second recorded letter to the church at Corinth, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul makes this very point. He tells them, beginning in verse 8 of 2 Corinthians 7, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I perceive that the same epistle... Made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Even in the Old Testament, remember the prophet Ezekiel talking about the watchman. He says what you need to do if you don't warn the sinner of his sinful ways and they die, they will pay for it. But also I will require their blood on you. Why? Because you didn't warn them. You didn't warn them. How important that is. Right along with that, congregational purity. Paul talked about that in his first recorded letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There he talks about how vital it is for a congregation to remain pure. Listen to what he says beginning in verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. See how Paul Paul was? And you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed as absent in body but present in spirit have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. 
In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Why? That his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. See, that's what Paul was always more concerned about than anything, was salvation. And whatever it took, regardless of how uncomfortable it was, Paul wanted people to be saved. That was his ultimate goal everywhere he went and everything he did. All of his sermons and all of his conversations and all of his teachings. He wanted people to be saved. You know, it might be popular, and it certainly is, especially in megachurches today, to allow people to continue in their sin. But that's not what we should ever do. Why? Because we love them too much. That's why. We need to keep the church pure. Sin can spread through a church just like wildfire. It can spread through a church so fast. Unity is something else that's more important than numbers. In Titus chapter 3, when Paul wrote to Titus, he tells them this, Chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. He says, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. See, troublemakers can cause others to do wrong. They can split a congregation, and it's just better to let the troublemaker and his followers leave. When there's divisions, the Bible says it reveals who is approved and who is not. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul made this point when he wrote to the church there about division. You know, the church at Corinth had lots of division. They were They are a very carnal congregation, very worldly. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 19, he says, For there must also be factions among you, notice that's the same word, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. So divisions often can show who's approved by God and who's not approved by God. So congregational unity is more important than having huge numbers. Huge numbers are wonderful if those numbers come with unity. But if you have those huge numbers and you don't have unity, what are you going to have? Trouble. That's what you're going to have. Lots and lots of trouble. Also, what's more important than numbers? Disciples, Christians who are very committed. Jesus, more than anyone, knew all about this. Back in John chapter 6, beginning in verse 60, by this time Jesus had performed lots of miracles of so many different kinds, healing and feeding. Now notice verse 60 of John chapter 6. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then, if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh promises nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Now notice this. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. 
Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. See, many people were just following Jesus for the physical benefits, like food and healing. They really weren't interested in spiritual things at all. They liked the miraculous food. They liked the miraculous healing. But Jesus desires only those truly committed to him. Jesus did not sugarcoat what it meant to be a disciple. He says, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to follow me. Take up your cross daily. Take up your cross daily, not once a week or once a month, but you've got to take it up daily. He wants commitment. And lastly, what's more important than numbers? Are the Christians following the narrow way? In Matthew 7, toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard these verses many times. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are a few who find it. Jesus said the broad way is packed full. But Jesus said it only leads to death and ruin. The narrow way, Jesus says, only has a few, but it leads to life. It leads to eternal life. Yeah, it's more difficult, it's more constrained but Jesus says it's going to be more than worth it. Remember that great scene in Revelation 21. In describing heaven, there's not going to be any more tears. There's not going to be any more sorrow. There's not going to be any more pain. No more death. Yes, it's worth it. There are simply some things more important than numbers. And I certainly realized it this week. By reading about all the different things and and. and Practices that people try to do to just get people to fill the pews. And it's very sad. It's better to stand with God with the minority than with Satan in the majority. And standing with God always starts with making that first commitment by repenting and being baptized. And that's where your journey begins. That life of commitment, that life of discipleship, that life of dedication. Sometimes we kind of fall by the side. We need help and we need strength and we need prayers. So as David leads us in this invitation song, if there is a need to respond, I encourage you to do that as we stand and sing this song.